Good evening, everyone. Well, more people than I thought would fit in here. Okay, for now we have uh, Mimoya. She will talk about everything and the kitchen sink and what to find in firmware images. This, uh, these are her findings from one year of research. She had the idea last year at GPN. And now let's hear what she has to say. Hey, uh, thank you all for coming. It's awesome to be speaking in, such, in, in front of such a large crowd. So let's talk about firmware. Um, small disclaimer, my knowledge is, about, is from reverse engineering. I do not work somewhere where I build firmware every day, so please take it with a bit of salt. Um, I want to teach you some knowledge which you could use if you would look at a hex dump of a firmware image. So not going too deep, uh, in, too deep into the actual uh, logic of a firmware, more about the headers, the structures, and the uh, data you can find in there. As stated, uh, last, year, last year on Saturday, I crashed IFD tool, and instead of fixing my bug, I started a rewrite in Go. And from there, I did uh, parse quite some uh, data structures you usually found, find in images. Um, this is going to be dense. I'm sorry. I have almost 70 slides for the upcoming 60 minutes, and they contain code. The slides are published, of course, so you can look them up if you want to build parse or whatever do you, uh, by yourself. So the first thing you w might want to know about firmware is where does my CPU start executing? When you boot your firmware, this is, for example, the end of a uh, firmware image. The only interesting thing is in the last line you see here, because your CPU jumps to minus 16, and it is in 16-bit mode. So we are only looking at this instruction you see there in the second line. And as we are in 16-bit mode, the last two bytes are discarded. They are not in, uh, part of the actual instruction. It's a short jump backwards in this particular case. Um, so it will jump backwards into the image, which is mapped to the end of the, fla uh, of the RAM. Um, and it will load all the U UFI specifics from there. So we can't talk about firmware without talking about UFI. Um, if you want to know something about UFI, the UFI in your image you're looking at, there is an awesome tool which have a, has an awesome uh, graphical user interface. It's the UFI tool. It's a cute tool. Uh, you can use it, and it will give you uh, a nice overview of the things that are in there. You can click around and get a tree, tree view. Um, if you are more bare bone uh, on your way, you can use Google Fiano, which is part of the Linux boot project, um, which gives you a Go wrapper around all the UFI data structures. Or, if you listen to me now, let's pass them by ourselves. Um, what exactly is UFI? UFI is an image or a UFI region is a file system. It's uh, separated into three, three structures. Those are volumes, regions, and files. Uh, volumes and regions are sp uh, specified. Files can co uh, contain some uh, free-flowing information. And the header of a, a UFI structure, a volume, a region, or a file, contains an identical GUID uh, with the respected information on what we are looking at. So if we took, take a look at our volume header, we see, OK, we have 16 bytes of 0. Then we have our volume GUID. We have our firmware lengths, and we have a signature. We have some attributes, header lengths, checksums, and so on, things that are nice to know, but you usually don't need so much. Um, so we can take a look at this. We can see this. You, you can usually, usually see your 16 uh, zeros by eye. Um, what you else want to take a look at is the uh, underscore FVH uh, signature. That's the EFI object signature. And if you are looking at the volume, then your last two entries in the header, the block map and the entry map. Um, the block map is an, uh, run an array of run length encoded uh, entries and is uh, determined, uh, terminated by an entry of 0 and 0. And your map entry uh, gives you an overview about the number of blocks and the length of the blocks. So you can now know, OK, my volume contains this amount of blocks after the header and uh, how, how big is each block. So you can extract your information from a volume. But you can read volumes, you can read regions in the same way, but, but what does it give a, a, of an advantage? Uh, 
well, if your CPU does this backward jumps, it this backward jump, it starts in the SEC uh, stage of UEFI. Well, the, it, uh, the RAM in it and CPU in it are done, and some very basic devices are initialized. From there, it will continue in the PEI stage, where the pre-EFI and the platform initialization will take place, and then it will prepare for the DXI phase, which is the driver stage of UEFI, which mounts drives, does UEFI runtimes and interfaces, prepares those to be uh, able to communicate with the operating system later on. It does uh, interface configuration, for example, um, co determines where you want to boot from, and then it loads your operating system. But you, we all know somehow how we deal with UEFI. The thing, the thing we are not used to see are updates. So if our vendor gives us updates, what are the formats UEFI specified to us to use? Well, those are in update capsules. Those are capsules, or those volumes have special GUIDs which uh, determine the type of update capsule. This is just an example of those I found and th the most common ones. Um, and let's take a look at two of those because they are quite complex. Um, the EFI file system st uh, uh, structure after the DUID contains an header size, the same flags we saw with the volume, the capsule image size, uh, and the sequence number, because those capsules can be sequenced and uh, uh, partitioned into several parts, and you've got your instance ID, the number in this sequence. Um, and then you've got a lot of offsets for parsing it if you want to, and you can take whatever you need, the flit, split information where, you, where it was split, but those are uh, bit fields, and I will not cap uh, talk about them now. The most common one I saw when I looked at uh, images was the EV2 file system capsule, and it was quite nice because you've got your header size, you've got your flags, you've got the size of your image, which is to be copied uh, perfectly bit for bit into your flash chip on your uh, mainboard, the image offset, and some o uh, OEM offset where the OEM can configure stuff. So if you have this type of capsule, you can just look at it, f find your offset, and go to the offset, extract your flash image from there. Quite nice. Um, so what does it look in Hexamp? If we take a look at this, we've ha we have our uh, 16 bytes of zero at the beginning. Then we have our EFI2, um, uh, EFI2 GUID. We have our uh, encoded uh, size. We know, OK, this is. Uh, 432 bits, 432 bit uh, coming from here, and then you have your offset. So yeah, that's directly uh, followed by the actual data. That's something you can see by the eye if you know what you're looking at. Um, so we talked about CPUs and how CPUs are initialized, and I think most of you know before you get the control over the flow of your CPU, Intel and your vendor have already started like five other CPUs and five other code paths. So let's talk about the Intel specifics you can find in a an, uh, in an, uh, modern firmware image. An Intel image is partitioned into the Intel flash descriptor, the IFD, the BIOS region, the management engine region, gigabit ethernet, and platform data. Sometimes in uh, even newer images, you will also find embedded controller images. The IFD is the big Intel header in your flash image. It's located at the beginning of the flash image, either at zero or at uh, 0x10. Um, it contains about inf information about the segments and the of the flash image. It contains information about the configuration uh, you want to run this image in and all the other stuff the CPU needs to know. Uh, your, your tool of choice, if you don't want to pass it yourself, is IFD tool. You will find it in the core boot tree. Um, address bits that are found in these headers are to be shifted four to the left, uh, so all your address addresses have to be aligned. Um, the IFD itself starts with the 5A A5 FOF, FOOF signature, um, and let's take a look at the IFD header that follows up, uh, after the signature. It's mainly, uh, mainly built from four interesting values and an uh, ME, value. So we first have our signature, then come for um, mappings we can use. Those are bit fields. Then some OEM reserved areas where all the uh, rest of the data usually is stored. Not all the time, but most of the time. And then we have some uh, ME uh, configuration map, which does not necessarily have to be there. The first map, the chip and region config, FL map 0. We have eight bits of component base address. And 
if we take out these eight bits and shift them to the, uh, to the left, we get our configurations for the different chips uh, that this image could be uh, burned onto. At this uh, offset, we will find an array of objects uh, contained uh, of this structure. So we have uh, 32 bits of uh, uh, FL comp, 32 bits of uh, FLIL comp, and some other data. Um, so let's just take those apart shortly. The FL comp gives basic information about what you can do with this chip. It's uh, does this chip ar uh, allow dual output, fast read support, or can it uh, read, for, uh, read or write certain uh, in instructions, and also the, identi uh, the, the density of the actual components. So if you have a, co uh, a computer with more than one flash chip, this would be your place where you could find your component density. The FLIL structure contains four illegal instructions. I have basically no clue what they're doing, but they are printed all the time if someone takes apart the uh, IFD header, so m maybe someone of you knows, I would be lucky to know it. Um, the rest of the bits from the uh, original FL map zero are the number of fl flash chips, six reserved bits, the region base address, which is where we can find our region configurations, which are uh, seven to nine uh, entries in an array, uh, which you can shift to the left and get the end or shift to the right, uh, get the start address of your region. Um, you have a number of regions field in three bits encoded, which is the, was the basically the only way to determine the flash descriptor version before, you, uh, before Coffee Lake and some reserved bits. The second FL map, so the second 32-byte, uh, a 32 bit after your uh, IFT signature is the, the F SPI and PCH, so the chipset configuration. It uh, has the master base address in the first eight bits where all the region access rights are stored and the number of masters. Uh, so let's take a look at those uh, sections here. Um, this basically determines as a bit field what, your, uh, what the access rights to your flash are. So is your, uh, your, baby, uh, your main operating system, for example, allowed to read or write the flash descriptor, allowed to read or write the BIOS region, ME region, and so on. This is stored several times for the several uh, requests that could be uh, sent to the system. And we have some more reserved six bits after the uh, FLMAP1. Um, the PCH strap base, where the PCH straps are stored and the number of PCH straps are stored here. And we have the FLMAP2 uh, entry, which uh, links to the CPU straps. So same thing, eight bits of, of CPU straps, uh, strap space and the number of CPU straps. And the new thing from since Coffee Lake, the FLMAP3. This is where we can now read the descriptor version, so we can we do, do no longer have to guess how many regions our image will contain. And this undocumented or not so good documented ME configuration, this contains ME VSCC, so ME uh, power uh, configuration and ME general configuration uh, addresses uh, to be used by the ME. Talking of the ME, how is the ME, ME image stored? We can now read it from, uh, from our flash because we know the region limits and it is in, organized into parti partitions. And of course, as everything with Intel, it starts with a header. Um, we have 16 bytes of reserved space. Most of the times they are zero. Um, then we have our dollar FTPF, FPT um, signature, then the number of entries, a version, a type, uh, a length, checksums, and so on, uh, general data. And following that, we have our partition uh, informations with the number of entries in it. A partition header has a name, it has an owner, it has an offset and a length, and some other uh, configuration stuff you usually don't need if you just want to read it from a firmware image. Um, if you now have a partition, a partition can contain containers, a container can contain modules. So uh, the containers you want to take a look at, um, uh, start, those starting with the MCP name, those are usually uh, configuration containers, uh, $MRM, MAN, and $MN2 uh, modules contain compressed code, usually Huffman encoded, so this is something that is too complex, I think, for one hour. I will skip it here. Um, 
Another thing you will encounter when talking about Intel images and Intel blobs and things we don't trust is the FSP. It's the Intel firmware support package. It's an Intel specific binary blob that's used to start the platform. For example, do RAM in it and you start, uh, start initializing things like cache as RAM and so on. It's distributed as most of the times three UFI volumes and they are are uh, easily recognizable because the first file in the first volume has a very speci uh, specific GUID you don't see uh, in other uh, files. Okay, we talked about Intel. So on the AMD side, what's there? Well, AMD doesn't directly have a, a IFD at the beginning of the image, but they have something similar. It's the firmware entry table. The PSP, the security processor of the AMD uh, CPUs, will look for this and will initialize the CPU accordingly. And it will look at the uh, 0x20,000 uh, offset in the flash image. For example, um, if, a, if you have a 16 megabyte image, all addre addresses will have a mapping of 0xFF. This depends on your image because your image is mapped to the end of the flash and based on your length, all offsets will shift. Um, so your P uh, PSP will find this firmware entry table at this offset. You first have a signature, then you have a ICM ROM base, a GEC ROM base, which is gigabit ethernet. You have X, uh, XHCI, which is USB, um, the PSP, where the PSP firmware lies, a new PSP firmware, and some other configurations. Um, so let's start at the top. Signature, similar to Intel, but not the same. It's 55AA, 55AA. That's kind of easy to find. You just look at your image, and if it has a zero, uh, zero, uh, the signature at this specific offset, you are quite sure you have a modern AMD image in front of you. So what do we find at the ICM ROM base? What's there if we take a look at this offset? We find another magic, the AMD IMC C magic. So what is an IMC? IMC is AMD's uh, embedded controller implementation. It's rarely used, but almost all CPUs have it. Some newer CPUs seem to ditch it. So if you have it, okay, you can uh, just take a look at it. It's barely documented, but the core boot wiki is your way to start here. The uh, next thing, gigabit ethernet. Yeah, okay, we all know what that is. It's hardware specific. Let's not take a look at that because we don't want to take a look at bytecode right now. Um, XHCI, so there are two versions of XHCI uh, firmware I found when taking a look at some images. Both run on V800 uh, chipsets from Renesis, um, and the Corbett wiki documented the old structure at least. If we take a look here, uh, according to the Corbett wiki, um, the XHCI offset, if you take a look there, you find a signature, you find an offset to your firmware, and from there you can find another uh, header which gives you the firmware version and then the firmware data. Okay, two indirections, but you can find your firmware if you want to take a look at that. The new XHCI firmware starts with this, and I have only found this one, uh, one version. There might be others, but uh, I haven't seen those in the wild. And if you take a look at this, there is a big block of zeros to the right. What might that be? Let's put it into our disassembler and realize, yeah, that's, those are jumps, what we are looking here. It's, it's a reset vector. This is the firmware. It starts with the firmware, and there's no header around that. So. We have our entry vector. If you want to take a look at this, maybe in a re uh, re re recently released reverse engineering tool, go for it. It's kind of easy to do. Um, but how are those things re uh, propagated to us users? Because Intel have this, has this FSP, which is lying in a GitHub repository as binary blobs, while AMD has this Agesa thing. Binary blobs are shipped, to my understanding, as an Agesa bundle we, you only get with an NDA. The format in the, which this bundle is distributed is known. Um, there is a specification, and Agesa is quite a short name for a long word. It's an inter interface, and they have it forever. Um, I don't have it. I don't know how it looks like, but we can take a look at the version of our Agesa. In Jara syntax, there are several uh, markers we can look at in our image if we want to take, a, uh, take knowledge about our Agesa. Um, there are always this AMD something something or the Agesa strings in there. So just a small uh, sample of things we are looking at. Those are several versions for sep several uh, PIs, several CPU in, uh, iterations, AMD distributes um, the Agesa for. 
They have changed the formats quite sometimes and usually having a higher Agesa version doesn't mean it's newer because when they release a new CPU and often the Agesa is backwards compatible, the, re uh, the version number will start with 0 point something again or 1 point something based on where you are uh, in the release cycle. But not uh, only the PSP, uh, not only the uh, actual boot code is contained in the Agesa, but also the PSP firmware um, I already talked about. The PSP, as stated, is AMD security coprocessor, and it boots in front of the main system unless you have a really old system, and it's required to boot unless you have a really old system, and it only runs sign code unless you have an exploit. Um, quite a nice thing. I kindly, kindly asked, and the author of PSP tool released his tool to take a look, like the UEFI tool, into PSP uh, firmware. He released it two or three days ago. Awesome. Please take a look at it if you are interested. You can find it with a GitHub search just using P, uh, the search query PSP tool. But if you have a modern system, how does it boot? Well, um, the it's pretty straightforward. It's as you think. The PSP on-chip uh, boot ROM will bootstrap the PSP. The PSP will do um, the signature verification of your flash image and your PSP firmware. It will re read and load its own bootloader, jump in there, and the bootloader will run the PSP operating system. From there, your main CPU operating system will be loaded and your CPU will be started, where your CPU can now take off and load all the UEFI stuff we already talked about. So. Where does this firmware lie if we take a look at our UFI code? Well, there you have two paddings. Usually it's stored in the second padding because AMD uh, doesn't distribute it as UFI volumes. It's just binary with offsets. So you fi usually find it in your padding. If you want to play around with your firmware image on AMD, don't touch the padding or it will, uh, will no longer boot. Other things we talked about the, uh, when you look, take a look at the uh, firmware entry table, there were the PSP he uh, headers, the firm PSP base addresses. So what do we find if we take a look at those? Well, there are three entries here, the PSP directory base, the new PSP directory base for newer versions of the PSP, and the BDH directory. The BDH directory is very similar to the PSP if you want to pass it with different magic values, so I will ignore it for now. Um, the PSP directory base, if you take a look over at this base address, you will find the PSP cookie. It's either $PSP or 2PSP. Um, and it will be the cookie, a checksum, the number of entries following, and some reserved field for padding. If you are in the situation to find a 2PSP header here, or 2PSP signature, um, this means the next two addresses you will take a look at aren't, aren't entries, but those are additional offsets to where your directories lie, where then hopefully you find your $PSP entries. Um, so how does an entry look that follows this header? It has a type, it has a size, it has a location and a reserved field. Pretty straightforward. Um, the type, duh, it's the type of the, t uh, of the entry you're looking at. This uh, table is incredibly long if you take a look at it. It's also, I took it from PSP tool. Um, there are over 1,000 entries AMD uses, as far as I know. But if you now have your type, your offset, and uh, you, you know your numbers, then you can build your uh, yourself quite the nice table of your directory and your entries and what you find in there. And usually your PSP image starts with the AMD public key, the AMD bootloader, and the recovery bootloader. So we have a public key, and we only want to run signed code. Where does this security come from? Well. The directory starts with the public key, so the bootloader reads the public key, it uses the public key uh, to verify the bootloader and jumps in there, the, the PSP bootloader, the on-ROM bootloader. But we have a problem. A end of 2018, AMD started to encrypt the bootloader. Mm. Okay, now we have a new type, it's the encrypted key, which is used to decrypt the bootloader before we jump into that, and it's using AES, and it's, for, for now it's looking quite good. So. How does this work? Image property of uh, CTS, I took their images. Your on-chip, your PSP on-chip has a key and it's using the type 0x21 encrypted key to reseed uh, the AES, uses the module key, it stores, takes from the inside to, um, to decrypt the bootloader and then be able to run it in an image. The boot ROM on the PSP, 
goes to the encryption key, go, uh, takes the encryption key to decrypt the bootloader. Okay, but we for now know those was were able uh, AMD was able to do this in a software update. So if you are able to uh, boot your operating system with an older image, you can still debug your bootloader because this appears to be a logic that was already available but not used before that. And there is a, a very special type of entries. Those are data entries. Uh, data entries contain 0x100 bytes of undocumented header, which is signed. And, of course, as everything, verified. If we take a look at it, we have our ID, we have a signed size, we have a signature fingerprint, we have a, a, a bit uh, to know if it is compressed, and if it is compressed, we get the size uh, further down in the header. We also get to know our version in BCD code, because AMD uses BCD code everywhere. Don't ask me why. And the header is verified, but we had uh, the, the problem that several images contained entries where the signed size was zero, so the data wasn't verified, this was the rise and fall vulnerability we uh, heard maybe last year about. And jumping, sprinting through this talk way too fast, um, I, I'm coming to my end, talking about what I'm not looking at, microcode. Because microcode doesn't have a header. There is no real magic. Okay, there is a header, but there is no magic you can look for. And it is very specific to AMD or Intel, and detecting microcode in your image is quite hard. You can only do st stochastics and statistics about the bytes you are looking at, and maybe find something that is uh, microcode related. Because the microcode is loaded by your firmware, and it is not as at a fixed offset. You know your Linux is able to run microcode updates on your CPU, so you just put it to an address and tell the CPU to go look there, but if you know you are have, you're looking at a microcode update, there is an extractor tool, which is by Platumov, the guy who also wrote the excellent ME extractor tool, if you want to take a look at those things. Um, yeah, and I'm sorry for running through this talk way too fast, but I'm coming to my end. I'm guessing you have a million of questions now. So first, thank you for your really deep dive into firmwares. And if you have questions, please raise your hands. I will come over to you and hand you the microphone. For the IFD, you mentioned that the offset is either 0 or 10. Do you have any information on well, what information this is based on? Or is it, do you have any, any guesses? Um, it's mainly about the age of the firmware image. Very old Intel CPUs had it at zero, and at some point it appeared, to my knowledge, at uh, 16 bytes into the image. Um, it was quite some time, so I think it's somewhere in the core to do uh, times around. I'm not perfectly sure here. Yeah, so when you say very old, you, you talk in 2006, 2008. Um, I'm not quite okay. sure, I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay, more questions? Okay, I don't see any more questions, then... Oh, <laughs> directly in front of me, sorry. Uh, so yeah, you mentioned that there in the AMD image there's this uh, public key for that's used to basically verify the, the firmware contents. Uh, so how exactly at boot up is this uh, public key verified uh, then? if it's just open in the flash? Uh, the public key is also distributed by MD freely, um, and it's uh, verified against the internal fingerprint of the, FSP, uh, of the PSP. It has an internal fingerprint to check it against. We cannot really exchange it, sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, um, could you use the microphone? Okay, for someone who uh, draws transistors and doesn't really uh, can't really follow this all in real time, uh, if I want to uh, find the information that you've been talking about uh, somewhere on the web, where would I do that? Um, I thought about this like five minutes before before the talk. Um, what do you prefer? I think I would just tweet it and give it a, 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 a shout it out to the internet. If you if you just 
yeah, I, I, have, I have a website, Google Mimoya, and I will put it online in like five minutes or something like that. That's maybe the easiest version. Okay, more questions? Otherwise, thank you very much. Oh. So you already did a lot of work even before the release of the PSP extraction tool. Um, how did you analyze the images before? Did you just go through them by hand? And I kindly see? asked the person who wrote PSP tool. He, we, we talked, we were in conversation, so I had a rough look. Corbett documented like the very basic of the uh, firmware entry table. The first four fields were documented. Other fields we just found by taking a look at, and then it was just parsing, parsing, and breaking my own parsers until I had a rough image of what I was going on. So you started with mentioning your IFD tool rewrite. Do you have any plans um, for contributing your, your changes back to the core boot uh, project, or maybe even including your rewrite, or? incorporating um, the fixes that you wanted to avoid in the first place? The IFD tool was fixed by uh, ages ago, so I just, it was my stupidity. I, it wasn't working the way I wanted it. Um, my Go rewrite is online on my GitHub, and IFD tool is actively uh, programmed on, and they are, there are more very good people taking a look at that. I re really do not have a lot to offer. Um, I, my tool does JSON output. That's everything different. So. You can take a look. Um, in general, I will con try to continue uh, adding the uh, PSP parsing to the Fiano project, the Linux boot Fiano parser uh, in the next time. Don't know when I have time and motivation. Yeah, cool. sounds great. I mean, you, you gave the talk here, so you already gave quite a few bits back. That's nice, thanks. Okay, then thank you and have a nice evening. <laughs>